to come Saturday, April 27, we will be having the encounter experience in Florida, and we're going to be in West Palm Beach at the Hilton Hotel at 150 Australian Avenue. If you have not yet shared the information with your friends and loved ones in Florida, it's very important that you start doing so. And if there are people who are in need of healing and deliverance who are living outside of the state of Florida, who you think might have an interest in attending the service, it's important that you circulate the information as soon as possible so that they can try to make all the necessary arrangements so that they'll make the service. Amen. We're going to have an amazing time in the presence of the Lord. The Lord's people will be visited by him. His presence will be rich in our midst. His glory will be felt. It shall surely come down in the house. Many will be transformed. Many will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Many will be revived. Many will be restored. So many will not just be healed physically or medically, but will be healed in their souls, in their minds. I cannot wait to meet you at the Hilton Hotel in West Palm Beach. Again, the address is 150 Australian Avenue and it's happening on the 27th of April. Now, unlike at other times when we usually would have two encounters in Florida, starting from the Friday night, this time around, we're only going to be having one Florida encounter. And so it's very important that you make every effort to make it to West Palm Beach. Whether you're living in Miami, Miramar, Pembroke Pines, whether you're living in Port Charlotte, you know all those places. You got to make all the arrangements and effort to be there. You don't want me to come so close to you and you're not there. All right. If you need to take the bus, do so. Train, do so. If you'd like me to help you to get there, via the bus or train, I will. But if you know the Lord has moved upon your heart and has bid you to come, just go, be there. It might be your moment, it might be your time. Hallelujah. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining. Today's sermon is titled, When the Oil is Upon You. Hallelujah. When the Oil is Upon on you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We love him. He's amazing. Hi, Delroy. It's good to have you. Okay, good. Delroy says we're coming right into his hometown. Praise God. So I know Delroy is going to be there for sure. I know Shauna Kay is going to try her best to be there. Tina, I'm not sure where you reside, but we're hoping to see as many of the remnants as possible. Amen. I cannot wait to meet other remnant. And it's a privilege. It's an honor. It's not anything that we have worked for. In fact, we are still trying to maintain our salvation here, right? We're still trying to ensure that we carry or bear the seal which shall mark us until that great day. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let us open in prayer this evening. Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak your word before your people. Thank you for your great grace. Thank you, Lord God, for knowledge. Thank you for understanding through your spirit. Thank you, Father, for pouring out the oil. And thank you, Father, for the explanation and edification that shall come from the sermon titled, When? the oil is upon you, Spirit of the living God. I decree right now in this atmosphere that the very ground on which I stand is holy. Father, you are welcome in this room. You're welcome also in this virtual space. Let it be a space in which your people will be tremendously blessed by your presence, blessed by your word, blessed by the breaking of bread. We look forward to eating fresh bread even now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Hallelujah. So family, I'm going to invite those of you who 
are on Facebook to join us on YouTube. Uh, yes, I was trying to remember that name, Port St. Lucie, Veronica. Yes, if you're in Port St. Lucie, you got to make that trip. You got to drive if you must to West Palm Beach. Very important. Fort Lauderdale, I did mention a few uh, places in Fort Lauderdale. You got to try to be there. All right. Praise God. So, I'm going to be sharing with you the link for you to join me on YouTube momentarily. Uh, for now, though, I want us to read the base text. It's being taken from Leviticus 10, in which we were the last time. And we're going to be reading verse 7. So the base text for this evening's sermon is Leviticus 10, verse 7. Leviticus 10, verse 7. And the text reads thus, And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the Lord of Moses, or rather the word of Moses. Let's read that again, verse 7 of Leviticus 10. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Say to someone, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. Please put those words in the comments. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. So I'm going to share with you, those of you on Facebook, the link to join us on YouTube. Hallelujah. I've just pasted it in the comments. Just come over YouTube. We're going to finish the sermon or start it on YouTube. Thank you so much, Stacy. That's right. Now, as you join on YouTube, please remember to give the video a like and a share so that others may join us. Tamika, hi, it's good to have you. Claudia, Cynthia, Stacy, it's good to have you. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. Tonight's sermon, as I said earlier, is titled, When the Oil is Upon You. Are we ready to hear from the Lord? So family, I've shared in the comments the link to take you directly to the stream on YouTube. I'll see you over here on YouTube. All right. So we're live on TikTok just the same, but we have ended the stream on Facebook because I want to focus on YouTube and TikTok for now. Is that okay, family? Okay. Give me one second. Okay, good. All right, so let's break down how things happened um, prior to getting to this scripture. The last time we met, we talked about the profane fire that was kindled before God in the tabernacle by Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. We talked about the fact that God saw the fire as strange because the way in which it was kindled was just not based on the protocols that should have guided the release of any kind of fire. In fact, it was interesting how they came up with their method of kindling a fire after seeing God released fire from his hands and onto his altar and throughout the tabernacle. So it could be that they were trying to imitate or emulate what they saw, which was a natural occurrence. In fact, may I say a supernatural occurrence. And that's the thing. We cannot emulate what God does. It's either God does it or it just isn't done. Any other way, if it doesn't come from God, is fraudulent. 
is camouflaged. Any other way is just fake. Such was the case when Pharaoh's magicians threw down their um, rods and their rods also turned into serpents, even as Moses' rod was turned into a serpent. But the point was, there was no way that their serpents could have been compared to the one that Moses' rod had turned into. And to make that bold statement that God is always going to be above, God is always going to be greater, and that God is always going to stand out. The Lord, as you know, caused the serpent of Moses to swallow up the serpent of Pharaoh's magicians. Amen. So when it comes directly from God, it's real, it's authentic, and it is supernatural. But when it's man that tries to construct it, it's always going to be an emulation and emulations never usually last for very long. And instead of emulations resulting in life, they usually result in death, even as it was in the case of Aaron's two sons. The Bible says that God sent forth a fire that consumed them. The first fire was a fire that was meant to show his approval for the sacrifice that was presented. But now this fire that God released afterward was a disapproval. It showed a disapproval of what they did. And whereas the first fire caused life to continue where the people of God were concerned because their sin were, sins rather were atoned for, this other fire resulted in death, unfortunately. So I want you to imagine being at the scene of what had just transpired. Aaron's two sons were now dead. The people are waiting on the outside of the courts. This was a very important moment, okay? Because it was the time when the people's sins were being atoned for. And we know that when it came on to atonement, either God would have accepted the ceremony or rejected the ceremony. And he accepted based on the priest and the people following line by line and precept by precept all the instructions that were given to them. So everything that they were commanded to perform, they needed to perform. They needed to dot all their I's and cross all their T's. And any variance or anything that might have caused a diversion, any diversion whatsoever, could have resulted in rejection. And it would have been very unfortunate if God rejected the atonement. First of all, if the atonement was rejected by the priests, sometimes the priests themselves would drop dead in the tabernacle. And if the priests die because the sins or whatever they did was not accepted by God, then it would have had some implications on the greater masses who were on the outside. Amen. And that is why whenever the priest went into the tabernacle, part of their garment that they wore as they ministered unto the Lord was it, it had on some things at the edges or at the hem and those things were made of fruits they were made of gold material but they were shaped in fruits maybe there were other materials that were there but for the most part when the things the ornaments so to speak which were very much symbolic clinged together as the priest walked you would hear a sound okay so imagine having multiple earrings or jewelries and you just have them clinging to each other that clinging sound it would be so loud oh glory to god thank you holy spirit i'm hearing now that the only way that the people could stay on the outside and hear the cling of these fruits that were represented by these golden formations was if they had a certain weight. Because if it was a light kind of thing, 
when they clung together, the people would not have heard. But now the Lord is bringing it to my attention that the garment that was worn by the priests was not a light thing. It wasn't a light garment like this dress that I'm wearing. Can you imagine the priest's clothes were very heavy because a part of their apron had on those ornaments that I said. And if they were made of real gold, you know, gold has weight. We're not talking about fake things now, like the material they used to make or coins today. We're talking about real gold. And when they clung together, they would make a sound. And so whenever the priest would go in, and would offer sacrifices unto God. If their sacrifices were accepted, then the priests would have come out of the tabernacle alive and would have represented themselves to the people. And the people would have rejoiced, especially after they were blessed by the priests. But if these priests' sacrifices were rejected by the living God, the priests would have died in the very tabernacle. And how would the people outside who were not permitted to enter the tabernacle at all know that the priests were dead? Two things would have happened. First of all, they would have noticed that the priests were taking way too long to come out of the tabernacle. Okay? It shouldn't take that long for them to perform all their duties inside. So that would have raised their suspicion. And the other thing that would have said to them that the priests are dead, they were struck dead by the Lord inside the tabernacle, is that they would have no longer heard that clinging that would have come from the sounds of the articles at the edge or hem of their garments. So the sound was very significant. I don't know how I got there, but I thought I would just say this to you so you could understand. So Aaron's two sons, Abihu and Nadab, they offered up sacrifices, right? And their sacrifices were their incense or whatever they did. It was profane. The Lord was wrought because of it and he killed them. Many believe that they were struck with lightning Whatever God did, they were dead. Now Aaron, their father, the high priest, had two bodies in front of him. The bodies of his two sons were there. Now, if you are a mother or a father who have ever lost a child, you would know what it feels like to look upon just the body of that child. No longer can the child respond to you. No longer can they behold you. No longer can he or she say mama or mom. If you've ever been in that position, then you would know how painful it is to see your children or your child dead. Now it's so hurtful when one of your ch children is dead, not to mention when two are dead at the same time. Perhaps the only people who would really understand how it feels would be those who have experienced it. Nonetheless, I want you to try your hardest to imagine how shocked Aaron was and how hurt he must have been. Now, a puzzled father who has suddenly been stricken with grief is being told by the living God in the moment, do not mourn the death of your children. So it's bad enough that you've lost them and lost them suddenly or tragically. But now you're being told that on top of that, you are not permitted to cry over their death. Now, why would God say such a thing? Because one, I want us to remember how they were put in a position to be killed to begin with. They were very disobedient. They disobeyed God. They mixed unholiness with holiness, uncleanness, 
with cleanness. And because they got it twisted, which meant that they allowed profanity to come in, defilement to come in, it caused God's anger to be kindled and the wages of sin is death. And the kind of death that we know the scripture means, it takes on two folds. Sometimes it has a literal or physical component and at other times we know that death also speaks to separation from God. So when the word of God says, the wages of sin is death, I want you to know that the Lord is saying to you that whenever sin is in your life, there's going to be a separation between you and him. Okay? So that's why when you feel like his presence ain't there and you know for sure that sin is in your life, you will get the understanding of what the scripture means. The death the scripture talks about has many implications, but one of the main implications is this. There will be separation from God whenever we entertain sin in our lives. You will not feel his presence because he will not be there. He will not bless sin. If sin is there, he's going to hide himself. His face you will not see. He can't look at it. He's too holy for it. So the wages of sin is death means separation from the living God. And as you can see, in the case of Aaron's two sons and in other instances around us in today's world, the consequences of sin oftentimes lead to physical death. But it's not a motor vehicle accident that had caused the death of these two sons. It wasn't that someone had stabbed them to death because they were in an altercation. It's God himself who killed them. And after killing them, we're saying, he commands that the father, who was now left to deal with the pain, he commanded that he does not cry. Again, this was because the basis on which they were killed was that they were very disobedient. And if, if Aaron had cried in that moment, see, the Lord said unto him, make sure you don't go removing the clothing or the garment from your head. You don't go putting on sackcloth and do not rend your garment because this is not one of those typical mourning occasions. God was saying, my judgment has come to your house. And when I judge, because my name was profaned, and because someone was disrespecting my holiness, you dare not cry. Because crying on such an occasion is to say to God that he's unreasonable. We, it's to say to him that he should never have done that. If Aaron ever cried, the message he'd be sending to God through his tears was, you're unfair. Your judgment is not true or it's not right. It would say so many things to God that would not have been true because he was fair enough to the point where he told them what was expected as opposed to what was not. All he commanded was for them to obey him. Now these men, knowing the truth and knowing what was acceptable, still went ahead and did their own thing. Now God had the right and was just in how he executed to ensure that they were separated from him. If Aaron ever cried, Aaron would have kind of undermined the judgment of God and undermined God's perspective and how God interpreted what was done to, to cause him to be grieved. So God said, Aaron, if you know what is best for you, you look at the bodies of your two sons just now and you bid them farewell and, and you're done, you'll be done. You just tell them bye. You better not allow me to see any tear falling from your eyes. Can you believe it? 
Hello? It's not one son that just passed. Two sons went suddenly. And God says, you better not let me see tears come out of your eyes. You better not open up your mouth claiming that you are wailing or mourning. You better not weep because if I ever hear it coming out of you, my wrath is going to come upon you too, Aaron. That means he's going to kill Aaron as well. And not only that, the Lord was so angered in that moment, there was a possibility that he could have wiped out the whole house of Israel or a significant portion of the house if he wanted to. Why was he so upset? What could have caused the living God to be so upset? What was it? What was it? What caused the Lord to be so furious? In a moment such as that, if I were there, I would have been afraid. It's almost like if you had said, hey, in the moment, he would have just struck you down. I would have been so afraid. Here is what the Lord said concerning why he was restraining or forbidding Aaron from going outside the tabernacle to be greeted by his family members and the rest of the community to be comforted or, or you know, and if he's comforted, it would have meant that he was grieving and God was saying, you better not grieve. Why did God Give Aaron such a harsh punishment. Let's read together again the base scripture and we will get the answer. It says in verse 7, And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. Do not go out because what? The anointing oil, the oil, the oil, the oil is upon you. In other words, Aaron, you have been consecrated. You've been set apart. You are now in a sacred position. You yourself are now representing that which is sacred. And so in this moment, we got to be on one accord. If you're set apart unto me, Aaron, which means the oil is on you, then we got to say the same thing. If you go out to mourn your son's death, it'll be a sign that we're not on the same page. Not only that, it will also say to God that you do not believe that you should be held accountable and even more accountable in God's sight than the average person. He said, do not leave from here to go crying because the anointing is on you. Therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, when the oil of the anointing is upon you, hallelujah, you who are here today, even in the year 2024, you are called to a place of greater levels of accountability. You're called to a place where the Lord wants you and him to be synchronized. You're called to a place where you just cannot do as the ordinary person does. You're called to a place where when God punishes you for your sins, you just gotta take it 
repent and if he still wants to chastise you, you got to take the chastisement. The Bible says that he chastises those he loves. Do you understand, family? When the oil is upon individuals, it means that the higher calling is on them. The glory cloud is over them. They represent God on all levels. Such people cannot afford to miss the mark. And if they do miss the mark, God has every right. Watch this. He has the right to chastise them and sometimes even in the open. Why? So that the people who would have seen the error or who were aware of the error would have known that God was not tolerating it. God was not endorsing it. So although he has chosen the servant and he has placed his oil on the servant, it doesn't mean that everything the servant does, he's in agreement with. So when that servant comes off track, has any kind of diversion or deviation, in order for God to still remain just in the sight of men, in order for him to be true and every man a liar, in order for him to maintain his name as being holy, and in order for him to continue to be glorified, then he maintains every right to deal with such deviations in any manner he chooses. Because by all means, he's going to protect his name and his integrity, not the integrity of the servant. God's integrity is more important than the integrity of whoever he uses. So if chastising who he uses so as to protect his godly integrity is what is necessary to make man know that he is God and he's set apart and he's honest and perfect in all his ways, he's going to do it. Do you understand? So he says, Aaron, the oil is on you. And when the oil is on you, I get the permission to chastise you if I want to. And if the oil is on you, then by all means, you're going to make me look good. You're going to make me be holy as I am holy. In other words, you will not give any man any room through which or that they can use to undermine the power of God or undermine the sacredness and holiness of God. So if it means telling someone who has lost their husband to not mourn the death of the husband because that husband was not even worshiping him to begin with, then God is going to do so. Today we have to thank God for Jesus Christ because I'm telling you, when we see how severe Aaron's punishment was, and may I say the punishment of his two sons was, it makes us all the more thankful for what Jesus has accomplished at the cross for us. Now imagine if there was not Christ and the cross, 
And you were called as a priest before God, which we are today, those who have accepted Christ. We are now his holy priesthood. If God had ever judged things in our lives and people in our lives because those things and people are deemed as profane, and we ever go being mournful or sorrowful over those things? Can you imagine that we would have put ourselves at risk of being killed? Ourselves? Some of us, we have lost family members because they were walking in disobedience and we know it. We know that the son who was killed in a bike crash, we know that he has been hanging out with bad company. We know that he has been having guns and stuff. We, we know that he's been doing stuff. We know his disobedience caused him to even have the desire to go on the bike at the time of night when he went on there. And we know that that's the reason he met in an accident. But what is at the baseline of him being crushed or killed? His disobedience. Now, had there not been Jesus Christ, you see some of those funerals we have had and enjoyed just by being in the company of people we know with all these lengthy programs and all these tributes. First of all, we could not have even thought about such things had there not been Jesus Christ on the cross. Because God is saying that the reason many people have lost their lives is because he judged them. And they were judged because of their disobedience. In other words, there are people today who we mourn over, whose death we cry over. As we think we are sympathizing and we are showing empathy. But God is saying, these people have been wicked to me. Whenever I spoke, they never listened. When I gave them dreams, they did not take heed. These people have been most disrespectful and dishonorable to me, God. And here you are crying to show sympathy with them. So whose side are you on? That's the question the Lord is asking. And that's the position in which Aaron was placed. Whose side are you on, Aaron? Are you on the side of injustice or justice? Because the judgment that has just reached your sons, as far as I got, I'm concerned, it was poured out on them because I ruled from a place of justice. I'm just in all my ways. If you go crying, you're trying to tell me that you're against me in this moment. You, you're hurt by what I did. But can't you see that I was hurt first because of the disrespect? So some of the things that we find ourselves enjoying today, we could never dare try them if we were living and existing in those days. Because it's either you're going to be in agreement with God or you're going to be against him. Can you believe it? And you know what? This principle is something that the men of old understood very well. I remember when I think it was Nathan who came to David and he told David what God said. David was compliant. Because David knew that he served a God who was just. He knew he served a God who was perfect in his judgments. So if God said, because you have done X, Y, Z, David, you are deserving of X punishment. Notice that they never, ever cursed God when God said, I'm going to punish you. Look at the life of David. Not even when Saul was pursuing him constantly. And he had to be going from place to place to save his life, at least so he thought, because really it was God who was saving him. 
Although he was unstable and was put in some of the most uncomfortable positions, he still did not curse God. Instead, the response was like, God, your will be done. There was a prophet who went to him when he made the mistake of starting to number the people of Israel through a census. Although the punishment was great, he accepted it because he knew that God's judgment was pure. Then on another occasion, and this happened after he went in to Bathsheba, and you know that this happened after he killed Bathsheba's wife and he sent yet another prophet to him. The prophet presented him with three different options. I don't know if this was the time I might be mixing up both because it might have been when it was the other sin that was committed that the three options were given. But we know that there was a time when he was presented with three options, the sword, the famine, and then there was another option. It's not coming to mind now, but if it does for you, you can put it in the comments. And David's response was so humble. You would have thought that David would have been like, God, you are just so unreasonable. Like why? But you're God, so you don't have to send these things. The reason God had to do something was so that man would know that he, God, does not endorse unrighteousness. He does not endorse profanity. The thing became known what he did. He knew what he did and those around him knew, but Sheba herself knew what he did. If God was to be a just God and holy, as he has always said he is, then he was going to have to do something about this. Okay? Because David had committed a sin and the wages of sin is death. Something was going to have to be done. And because the pestilence, thank you so much, because David knew the perspective from which the judgment was going to come upon him. He knew that God was judging from his throne of holiness. He did not debate. He did not have a protest. He did not go saying, Lord, why you do this? I don't deserve this. I've been with you since I was a child. I've slain Goliath. I have put aside the sheep of the pasture just to feed your literal sheep. And I've done this and I he took the chastisement. He humbled himself. Even by subjecting himself to the chastisement. Why? Because when the oil is upon you, the accountability is greater. So every time God puts the oil on someone, they carry a greater level of anointing. They function deeper in the realm of the spirit. Their responsibilities are greater. The oil is basically very much in great measure on that person's life. You got to understand that even as the responsibilities are greater, so are the chastisements. So are the punishments. Do you understand me? And God, through this example with Aaron, was saying, if I chastise you because I feel like you were disrespectful or what you did was out of line or out of order, do not cry. Do not cry. We thank God for Jesus Christ today because Jesus Christ, I believe, has made the punishment less severe. 
yet when the punishment does come the lord wants us to remain in a place of agreement with him shall two walk together unless they agree if you're going to continue on this walk you better make sure that you agree with him in all of his judgments do you hear me had it not been for jesus who has given us that grand invitation for us to come to the throne of grace where we can find mercy and obtain grace in times of need. Many of us would not have been here today. And I want you to notice who the people are to whom I am referring. I'm talking to people upon whom is the oil. When Aaron's sons were being judged, notice that we never heard that anybody from the congregation was judged as well. Sometimes God has to show himself as holy and set apart by visiting the iniquities that are found in the lives of those who are also supposed to be set apart unto him. If he does not do that, then he would make himself a corrupt God. And it would seem as though God meddles with sins and filth and corruption. And he will not do that ever. He's very protective of his name and his reputation. That's why he says, even in this very sad text, he continued to say, I think on more than one occasion, he said, I shall be glorified. I shall be glorified. God wants his glory. There's nothing in man that makes man one that's deserving of the glory that God really deserves. He says, your righteousness is filthy before me. So let God be God and let him do whatever is necessary to make himself glorified. I will be glorified, the Lord says. And whatever it takes for him to get his glory, he's going to do it. And if anything stands in the way of him being glorified, it's going to feel his wrath. Moses felt it. When the Lord said unto Moses, now speak to the rock and it shall bring forth its waters. And he went there and he struck the rock. The Lord was so wroth. The Lord said unto Moses, because you did not honor me. And in other versions of scripture, it said, because you refused to glorify me, you robbed me of my glory. I'm going to punish you in this manner that you will not see the promised land or you'll not go over there. These two sons of Aaron were playing with fire, profane fire. It's a fire that came by a means other than the cross and Jesus Christ. And the only way true glory and honor can be given to God here on earth is if they come by means of going through Christ.
if whatever we do does not honor Christ or does not represent grace that comes through him or the Christ experience, the cross experience, and we're talking in the context of Christian worship and fellowship, If those things that we do, as we come to minister unto God as priests, because we have now taken on the role of Aaron, we are now the priests, you know. And when we say we gather in the sanctuary on a Saturday or Sunday to worship, it's the same thing that Aaron was doing when he was in the tabernacle. If there's any aspect of our so-called worship experience that is not founded on the cross of Jesus Christ. It is profane. So therefore, let us not allow people to introduce to us anything that is strange. If scripture did not mention it, it's strange. When we are building altars, for instance, in our different worship spaces as we look on those altars for instance I, I made reference to this the last time we met can you see Christ and the cross through all the different things that are on those altars when we see green leaf what do the green leaves represent how how does that correlate with what Christ did at the cross what aspect of the Calvary cross experience is represented by the green leaf that is found on the altar at some people's place of worship? What is the meaning of all of these beads, gold and silver? What do they represent and how, do, how can these beads be compared with something that was at the cross or with what shall they be compared? If Christ Jesus and the cross are not part of the foundation or at the foundation of whatever we do in the name of God, then it's strange and very profane. And anything that is strange and profane will receive the wrath and judgment of God. And it will lead to death. And what do we say death is? Total separation from God. Are you hearing me? Now, because of Christ Jesus, Today we can do things in the presence of God and not be struck down immediately like how Aaron's sons were struck down because of Jesus Christ. Because truth be told, some of the things that we do today in the face of God are a sign that we have no reverence for him. We don't fear him. We dishonor him. And we forget that he's holy. And so if we're approaching him, our approach has to be holy. How do we approach a holy God with so much of pride in our hearts? How do we approach a holy God looking anyhow, even though the Holy Spirit is speaking to us in our ears, telling us that's not acceptable right now? You can wear that for your everyday experience, but right now, as you minister to God, that's not acceptable. No, we hear him talk, but we ignore because we are so caught up in ourselves and being trendy these days. Forgetting that God is holy and because he's holy, it means we have to do as he says and meet his requirement and anything outside of that is going to be a disrespect. 
So right now, there is a lot of disrespecting that is happening in the face of the Lord. And I'm here to say it's not because the Lord does not or is that because he's now tolerating these things? It's not because he has had a change of heart and has now become more lenient toward ungodliness and toward sin and profanity. That's not the case. The reason why people are not dropping dead like flies today is simply because of Jesus Christ, his blood and the cross. Tell two people he's the same God. I'm telling you, he is the same God. And that's why he has to still chastise his servants and sometimes chastise them publicly or openly. Otherwise, people will think that he has become slack. And if slack, it means that he's no longer holy. He's no longer set apart. He's just like one of us. Oh, no, God will not have it that anyone should undermine his holiness. Do you hear me? Do you understand? And some of the things that the ordinary people will get away with or will seemingly get away with, I'm here to say the child of God will not. Because there's something about when the oil is upon you. When the oil is upon you, which means you function at a higher place your responsibilities are greater. Your blessings are sometimes even greater. Then so too must your punishments be. So it's a good thing when the oil is upon an individual in the sense that it means that they are closer to God. That's the good part. But on the other hand, one bad move, one mistake can cost the individual, not just their marriage or their family, not just their ministry, not just a son or a daughter, who they refuse to correct in righteousness. But it might cost that said man or woman of God his or her life. Let us pray. Let me see those of you who understand the word tonight. Raise your hands. Say, Lord, draw me closer to you. Help me to understand your voice. Help me to walk in your fear. Help me to accept your judgments and your chastisement. Because the reason you chastise in the first place is because your love toward me is immeasurable. Let me see those of you who want to receive Christ Jesus because you believe what he did for you at the cross. Say after me, Father, I confess that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is Lord. He died for me so that I might live and have life more abundantly. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Make me into your new creature. Make me into your image because my lifestyle 
has been contrary up to this point. But now, Lord, I surrender all. Hallelujah. Family, remember, as I said, that come Saturday, April 27, we will be having the encounter experience in Florida, in West Palm Beach. Now, if you're listening and you're going to be attending the service from out of state or from a place far away and you'd like to stay over and you'd like hotel information, please send a WhatsApp message to plus one eight seven six three one nine five one six three. On the 27th of April, we're having one encounter in Florida, and it's going to be at the Hilton Hotel in West Palm Beach, 150 Australian Avenue. There's a flyer on my Facebook page. Please circulate the flyer to as many people as possible. If you can put it on your WhatsApp as your profile pic or your DP, that would be greatly appreciated if you're so led to do so. Remember to look out for fraudsters who are sending people messages through TikTok, please know it's not me. And if they're sending you messages through YouTube and other platforms, especially telling you about an orphanage and asking you for money, it's not me. God bless you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. I love you. Before you go, please ensure you hit like on this broadcast. Thank you so much. I'm seeing some people have joined us on YouTube, but they've not liked the broadcast. Please ensure you do that before you go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Lorraine Guthrie. Thank you.